Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, my God. Use <laughs> <laughs> error 83. I'm Joe. I'm Alan. And I'm Dan. And we're back. And we've got something new for you. Hashtag error ask. So it's the other way around. This is a question for you, dear listener. And the question is, what's the dumbest idea for an app you can come up with? And it has to be original. Think yo dumb. And we want you to either tweet with the hashtag error ask, or you can go to error.show slash contact, or you can go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash telegram and join us in there. So what's the dumbest idea for an app you can come up with? When you said think yo dumb, I, I'm pretty sure not everyone's going to understand that what you mean by that is there was an app called Yo and it was really dumb. I think well, the, that may come across is think yo dumb. <laughs> <Like>. <laughs> oh, okay. No, think dumb as in yo, the app where you literally had one button and it was, it would send a yo to someone else mm -hmm. and you added your friends on it and just sent yo to each other. So maybe if people are having difficulty thinking one, shall I give you a starter so they can maybe be inspired by my dumb idea, perhaps? Go on then. Is it as dumb as yo? You know, I can't tell if this is genius or stupid. You're going to have to help me with this. Um, a chat app that only works when you're offline. As soon as you go online, it disconnects and won't work. And then when you go into airplane mode, the chat app opens and you can type stuff. But the second you go online, it disconnects and won't actually do anything. So it works kind of the opposite way to every other chat app on the planet. But it means you could go offline and not be distracted and sit there and type your chat at people. And then you have to go online again to send it. But the second you go online, you can't type anymore. That sounds like some of it exists, but I can't remember what it's called. Um, Ubuntu phone? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> oh, shots fired. <laughs> That, that's a good example, though. If that doesn't exist, then yeah, that's a good good example of a pretty dumb app. Right. Yes, it's pretty stupid. So I, I came up with a stupid app idea, too. It's a recipe app, but it's only for boxed foods. So like mac and cheese. But it just says to read the directions on the box. It doesn't even have the recipe. <laughs> 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 just whatever it is, just read the directions. So you can make a book and print a book, which is just, you know, recipe ingredients, go to the shop and buy mac and cheese ingredients, read the pack, <laughs> like, and then a photo <laughs> of what it should look like when you make it. The picture of the box, and it's just like, read these. Yeah, you could just have a photo in the app. Of the box. Of that bit of the box, yeah. But it's like a poor quality photo that's too small, so you can't actually see the directions in the photo. <laughs> <laughs> A <laughs> really shitty JPEG. <laughs> Genius. So yeah, remember that hashtag error ask. You can also, of course, use hashtag ask error, and that's for questions for us. And you can use that in the same places, in the Telegram group, on Twitter, or error.show slash contact. So the first one for this episode, have you ever met your own doppelganger? There was one time that I was in a bar, and there was a guy who had an extremely similar haircut and a very extremely similar outfit, but didn't really look like me. But that's as close as I got. Does a doppelganger really exist? This idea that there's someone out there who looks exactly like you? Does it really have to be exactly like you? I mean, okay, by definition, yes, it does. But surely it only has to be sufficiently like you to fool other people. Like, it doesn't have to have the same number of nipples as you, or doesn't have to have that scar on the back of your leg or something. It can just be someone who sufficiently passes as you that other people are fooled, surely. Okay, so in that case, I've never met my doppelganger, but I have seen him in a cartoon with a bad Scottish accent. <laughs> Is this Shrek? Yes, I've said that before. Hmm... There was this conspiracy among all my friends to call me that without me realizing it. And that's what made me believe in conspiracy theories, because it took several months for me to find out, maybe years even. That's weird, because on um, the Ubuntu podcast with Tony Whitmore, uh, someone took a photo of him at his house while we were recording one day, 
and someone else said he looked like Shrek and then just put the antennas on the top of his head and it was fucking uncanny. It really, <laughs> it really was. And I think that might have triggered him to go on a bit of a diet and lose a bit of weight. So, yeah, there was a positive outcome from the horrific bullying that he got from, <laughs> from us online. So, you know, every cloud has a silver lining. What about you, though? Uh, Elvis, ha 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 ha. Uh, I get that a lot. I get the old Elvis thing a lot, and I milk it a bit sometimes. Um, I had it once on a on a plane where the, the steward uh, walked uh, along the plane. He kept looking at me, and then I turned around and looked to the galley, and one of the stewardesses and him were pointing at me. And as I turned around, I saw them pointing, and they went <gasps> and realised I'd seen them and caught them pointing at me. And <laughs> she she came over and and said sorry and then for the last 20 minutes of the flight was crouched on her knees next to my seat passing me wine and and apologizing profusely and saying how much she loved elvis and um and, and they once had one of the backing singers from elvis's backing band or something on the plane and we're not supposed to ask them for signatures but i had to ask them for their autograph and i was like okay shut up and give me more wine yeah that that was the most extreme one of the elvis ones but i have had um there's another kid at my daughter's school whose dad i look like and they have given the child to the wrong parent oh, no. before now because <laughs> with that i like yes that, that yes. is terrible i'm standing there and someone else's daughter is walking towards me and i'm like no that's not mine <laughs> <laughs> they were like oh i thought you were andy and i'm like no no so there there is and weirdly it's like very nearby and we're good friends but I think it's just, you know, we're a bit slob-like and have black hair with grey bits in it, and that's it. That's all you, all you need to be um, my doppelganger. In your roles, I imagine there is a fair degree of context switching. So can you just jump right into each type of task, or do you have a ritual and or some prep before? I'm willing to bet Dan has a ritual. No, I my ritual is like panic be like oh shit i had to do that thing be 20 minutes late for a podcast because <laughs> <laughs> we all do a fair number of different things within our jobs don't we i think it's good though to do different kinds of things because it breaks up the day i feel like if i had to do the same thing all day that it could be boring and it just feels more productive to be like okay i'm gonna work on something and then if I start to not feel very motivated on that, then I can do something different. And I feel productive all day because I'm doing different kinds of things. I used to be really interrupt driven and I still am to some degree. And I get, I've got a bunch of windows open and any one of them could ping at me at any time. And I, I would glance at it because I've got three screens. There's quite a lot going on, which means, yeah, it's possible to be easily distracted. But sometimes I'm in the middle of like building some software and, you know, the old it's compiling. I'm waiting while it's compiling. And while that's happening, I can go and glance at a couple of chat things and see if there's any conversations I should be aware of or be involved in. It's only useful to do that at that time because this thing's going to compile for 10 minutes and I can't realistically do anything productive in that 10 minutes other than, you know, scroll back a couple of IRC channels or telegram groups or refresh Twitter or something like that. Yeah, when you've got such tiny amounts of time to do something with, um, I find I can, I don't mind being interrupted. My mind can context switch away. But if I'm focused on something like writing a blog, or if I have to resolve some deep technical problem, then I'll probably switch to another workspace and try and focus on that one thing and ignore any notifications and just not, not reply to anything. Yeah, I sometimes turn my notifications off or turn my phone over and just focus on that one task that I'm doing. But usually, I'm just context switching left, right, and center. I might be reading some RSS feeds, and then I've, I'm chatting to someone about something, and then I'm chatting to someone else. And I, I think I'd probably be more productive if I just did things one at a time, but it just doesn't really work out that way. I think what I lose is the sense of achievement because it's just chipping away a little bit at lots of different different tasks. Whereas I get a good sense of achievement if I block out time in my calendar 
for doing particular things. So for example, I have uh, a meeting in my calendar was just got me on it that is uh you know checking on the stats of something or checking on build logs or spend an hour on the forum or you know responding to community questions and stuff like that so i i block that time out so nominally that time is set aside and people don't book meetings at, the, at those slots in my day and it means i can totally focus on that one thing it doesn't mean I spend the whole time doing it because if I finish reading all the unread threads in the first 10 minutes, then I've got some spare time that I could do something else that I hadn't accounted for. But I do try and block time out. And in the past, I've tried leaving the house and, you know, sitting in a park and stuff like that to try and empty my brain a little bit of all the distractions. But that doesn't always work. That is something that's really nice about software development as compared to other kinds of tasks is that it's really easy to like have a really tangible record of like, oh, this is how many pull requests I submitted this day, or this is how many issues I filed or, you know, whatever. Like you can see like the contributions you made in a really like measurable way. And then you'd be like, oh, look how many things I did today. It feels good. And when you're like trying to do more managerial things or things that are more like discussions or planning. Sometimes it could be more abstract and you're like, I have no idea how much I got done today. Yeah. And those, those meetings you end up having, especially I find an afternoon can very quickly fill up with a bunch of meetings and that just like nukes your afternoon. It's just useless. So we've tried uh, in teams I've been in to implement a policy where there are items on the agenda for the meeting and if people turn up and there's nothing on the agenda then you just leave straight away there's no point sticking around if nobody's got anything to discuss and so if you don't have it in the document before the meeting starts then there's nothing to discuss basically and you can't just bring random stuff up at the time because it just wastes everyone's time so that's a nice way of making sure you don't waste like chunks of your day at redundant meetings well, we do uh, our weekly stand-up meeting, and we have a pretty similar system to it where it's just like we bring things to the meeting because they need to be shared with each other. But if you start getting into like implementation details, like that's not the purpose of the meeting. And you're like, no, 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 stop. Like, go discuss that after the meeting with that person. Like, we're here to chug through the list of things that everybody needs to be aware of, and that's it. Yeah. So I have a Friday catch-up every other Friday with another team and we have a document that's shared that's linked from the calendar invite and if nobody puts anything in it by like 12 o'clock the meetings are half past 12 and if nobody puts anything in there by 12 o'clock then we just ping each other and say I haven't got anything neither have I okay skip it this week and you've got some of your time back and nobody nobody likes that feeling that you've just sat there for an hour listening to people argue about something that could have been done in an email or could have been done as a pull request or a design document or something everybody hates that because it feels like you just you know it's an hour of your life you'll never get back so being more rigorous about when you actually have interviews and don't just have them for the sake of having them gives you a sense that you've got that time back what's missing from linux and open source conferences i think uh white middle-aged men (laughs) beer pizza I think we should definitely do with more of that. Young people. Young people. Elaborate. I think one of the problems we have at many Linux and open source conferences is preaching to the choir uh, or preaching to the converted. We're constantly talking to an audience of already converted, like-minded people who aren't new on this journey. And I worry that we don't do a good job of attracting fresh blood because the older gray beards in the Linux world are starting to retire, uh, move on, die. And we need people to come up from below and fill those leadership positions. And there aren't enough of them. And if we don't start that on ramp of getting younger people involved in Linux and open source early enough, then there'll be no one to fill the shoes of the greybeards as they die off and retire. But Alan, young people always want to change things, and we hate change. Do you? No, I don't. I do. So I think with youth often comes 
enthusiasm and arrogance, maybe. When people are new to something, they think that they've got these great ideas that no one's ever thought of before. And I think we've talked about that on this show. How do you stop that happening? How do you bring in young people and keep them humble? I'm not sure that's necessarily a problem because often the young people have time and enthusiasm on their side. Uh, and what they don't have is gobs and gobs and gobs of cynicism that uh, the rest of us have. Uh, and sometimes you need young people who have a different view on the world. And maybe some of these things that we've held dear for many years need to change. Maybe uh, some of the tools and utilities that we've been using or the licenses we've become accustomed to are great, but it's time for something new. And I don't think it's unreasonable that young people with a lot of time on their hands and uh, a lot of uh, creative thought could come up with replacements or new and innovative ways of thinking about things or new languages or ways to use the new languages that some of us old farts aren't going to appreciate. And yeah, that means change. And that's fine because there is constant change. You just don't see it because it's mostly drip, drip, drip. What you're talking about, Joe, is the massive change, the you know, the big sea change from one technology to another or throwing something out because it's terrible. Um, I think it's, I think it's perfectly reasonable for people to come along and say this thing should be changed. And here are the reasons why it should be changed. It's not only technical change though, the social change within projects that we've seen over the last year or two, which is, I think, being driven by mostly young people. Yeah. I think in general, newcomers, bring things to the table and and don't have all the same assumptions and breaking up some of the similarities between everybody's thought processes is, I think, generally a good thing that we could use a little bit of, of disruption in that way. Something I, I feel that would be more beneficial is bringing in people that are um, I guess more on the kind of consumer side of things. It seems like when we get together, we get like all the like maintainers together and it's like all people that like build these technologies and we don't really get as many of the people that are using the technologies. And so I think it would be insanely beneficial like uh, at Linux App Summit to have more app developers there and being able to talk directly to people that are developing APIs and toolkits and things like that. I think that would be super beneficial and and a huge important kind of perspective change than just getting people together that like you said you're kind of preaching to the choir like everybody's already kind of on board with like yeah we're developing these things cuz we're platform maintainers and and getting people that are outside of that bubble who like have no idea how the stack has evolved over the years and just want to like make a thing I think their perspective would be super valuable. Right. And I think some of us, and I say us because, you know, I, I consider myself part of this, are very often not open to the new ways of doing things. Like, you think of technologies like KDE and Qt and GTK and GNOME, who've been around for many years, and they haven't made as much of a dent in the world as probably they would have liked, I would imagine. I'm not directly involved in any of those four projects, but I would imagine none of them are super happy with their market penetration. I think to some degree they might be happy, but not, not, you know, they, none of them have become, uh, you know, Apple, Microsoft, Google, you know, whoever. Um, and I think there is the possibility that other young upstarts come along and steal a march on their progress. And a, a good example of that is Electron. So statistically, way more people create new applications using Electron than create new applications using GTK or Qt or KDE or GNOME. Now, you could argue whether that's good or bad, but it's very much easier to find new, fresh applications that are written using Electron than it is to find new, fresh applications that are written for GNOME or KDE. 
why is that? Like, start looking into why that might be. What has Electron done that KDE and GNOME haven't, or that GTK and Qt haven't? How have they made it so that the on-ramp is easier for new developers, these potential young people with a brand new laptop and a brand new fresh GitHub account, have been able to create new applications that rise to the top of Hacker News or Product Hunt or um lobsters or slash dot or whatever that pop up to the the top of the news art sites and people want to install because they've got useful functionality that people need right why are those things popular and gnome and kde isn't and i think we could learn something so i completely agree with dan we should bring those developers in and learn from them and I think we would get some very frank opinions from them about how the experience of developing apps for Linux is hard, difficult. And I know the elementary guys are doing a lot of work to make that easier, and they certainly have well-defined processes for that. But I think we could do better. I think I'm broadly in agreement with both of you, really, that we need to have new blood whether that is younger people or older people or just people of a different demographic generally, I think making it more diverse is always going to be good. I think that's incredibly hard because it kind of feels like a bunch of friends getting together for conferences. Obviously, the bigger ones, not so much, but smaller ones is generally people who already know each other. So I think by being more welcoming and more sort of overtly welcoming to new people, that would probably be good. Um, and yeah, getting users there as well as developers, uh, rather than it being just this kind of clique of just the people making the applications, having people who actually use the software and only use it, being able to give direct feedback and having that conversation with people who do the development, I think is very valuable. And it's always more valuable face-to-face -face rather than online. So yeah, I think more normal users and maybe people who use other operating systems and are just curious about this whole open source thing. Um, I think we've got to a point now where we're less judgy. There was a time when people would see Macs or Windows machines and scoff and take the piss out of people. Um, but I think sort of code of conduct, codes of conduct are making that better. So yeah, just just different people, I suppose. But then Fostock Live is nice in that it's just all people we know generally. But I suppose if we had people we didn't know there as well, that would be good. I think you've got to not displace the people who are already going. You need to just add to that. Something I found really interesting about like Linux Fest Northwest is it did seem to have a little bit more of an audience of newcomers and people that maybe weren't familiar with open source software, really. And I don't really know how they do that exactly, but it, it seemed that there was a very clear distinction of like workshops and talks and not just like, I think that, uh, some of the like kind of Gnome conferences and stuff, we have this idea of like boffs on like a round table, right? And it's not just like a presentation or a lecture. It's like a workshop. And, and I think that's something that I haven't seen as much at other conferences. Um, and, and I, I know that there's been some like boff sessions that's like make a snap and stuff like that. But I, I think that that isn't something that many conferences are headlining as a feature of the conference is like, we will have a track of workshops where you will learn things. Uh, I don't know if we're really doing that as hard as we probably should. Should you yes and life? So yes and, for those who don't know, is a concept from improvisational comedy, improv, or impro, I think, as it's sometimes called in this country. And the idea is that no matter what someone says to you, you go with it. You say yes, and the next thing. You don't, um, you know, if someone says to you, um, uh, uh, good morning, Would you? how much money would you like to take out of your bank account? You don't say, what, I'm a farmer in a field. You know, you say, oh, yes, I'd like to take out 200 pounds, please, or whatever. You just keep going with the thing. And this can be applied to life, I think, where you just say yes to 
almost everything or ideally everything. If someone says, do you want to go for a curry? You say, yes, let's go for the curry. Um, if someone says, do you want to join this band? You say, yeah, I'm going to join that band. So should you do that or should you be far more selective as to what you say yes to? I thought this was something else. So in your actual question, which is, should you be more willing to say yes? I think there are limits to this because I, I say yes too much and then I end up with a full plate and I have to hand off stuff or let people down because I can't complete the task that they've asked me to do. So I actually would rather say no more often and be upfront about saying, no, I can't do that rather than, yes, I can do that. And then later on, I'm sorry, I didn't get time to do that thing that I already promised that I would do. So I, I would rather have in, in cases where someone's asking of me to do something for them. I would rather be able to err on the side of no, if at all possible, not to get out of doing stuff, but just because I've got enough stuff to do myself, let alone doing your stuff. But the flip side is with family. I recently saw, I can't remember a celebrity or someone, I don't know if it was a life coach or something who said to be a good parent, when your children ask for something or ask to do something, you just do it there and then. You don't say, yeah, we'll do that next week, or maybe, or, oh, I don't know if we can do that. You just go, yep, let's do it, and then just get on and do it straight away. And I know I've been guilty of not doing stuff straight away. Like the kids will say, hey, could we go here sometime? And it's the weekend, and we could go there right now. There's nothing stopping us going there right now, whether it's bowling or cinema or whatever, and just say yes to the kids because, yeah, as I have lamented in the past, there is limited time on this planet. Might as well do stuff. Whereas for work, where someone is just paying you to do stuff, if you've run out of time, then you're going to disappoint people. Uh, but yeah, there's a limited amount of your time you can spend at work, if that makes sense. Yeah, I guess this is like really dependent on control, right? Like if, if it's something that you have control over, then I feel like in general, the better advice is like focus is about saying no, right? And And you can't do everything well. Like there's only so much time in the day. There's only so much energy. So if you really want to do things well, you have to focus. And that means saying no to doing too many things. But if it's something that's out of your control, then I think that it's more of, um, and, and in this quote this is like attributed to everybody in the world. So I don't know where it came from, but it's that like suffering is pain times resistance you know, and it, it, pain is is um, unavoidable, but but suffering is is optional. You don't have to suffer through something if you accept the pain, and you just yes and that. Like that's I think a better way to deal with things that are outside of your control. Like okay, this bad thing happened to me, but I don't have to like continually resist it and you know fight against it and complain and you know worry and. Like, just kind of roll with it and move on. It kind of comes back to that other quote that I don't even know where it came from. You always regret the things that you haven't done, and you very seldom regret the things that you have done, even if they turn out to be bad. And that would be an argument for yes-anding life. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, I think with social situations, that can be really good because um, especially if you're um, a person like me that is often more inclined to say, no, I like it inside, that more times than not when someone has asked me, hey, do you want to go do this thing? And I've thought, no, I want to stay inside in my pajamas. And then I went anyway. I was like, wow, I'm really glad I went and did the thing. So for that situation, I feel like that it's more useful to just say yes but like Alan said, in a work situation, I feel like when it comes to like things that if you don't do this, now it messes things up for other people. Or if you can't do this well, and now it messes things up. That seems like it's something where you're more inclined to say no more often because somebody else might have the ability to focus on that task and do it better. The way I first interpreted this when I saw it before you'd explained it was more of a being positive and and not 
putting down other people's conversations and actually just in a conversational style or in a meeting where someone makes a suggestion rather than say, no, we shouldn't do it like that. We should do it like this. You build upon the other person's idea. I guess that goes back to the improv idea when you're in a creative situation, you know, building upon the creative ideas that other people have. I guess the difficulty is I don't often sit in situations where I'm collaborating with other people uh, on a creative task. I did last week. I spent the the week in London with a bunch of designers and developers working on the Ubuntu theme. And I did have in the back of my head this question when people were saying, should we do this and should we change that? And I was doing my absolute best to not put down other people's ideas, but try and build upon them. So rather than say that won't work because of this, try and turn it into yes, and we could also do this or yes, and consider these other options as well. I don't know that it made it any better for me or that I achieved anything by doing it, but I did feel a lot better for doing it. I did feel like I was being more positive. I don't think that is an entirely separate idea or concept though to what I was thinking of with this question, because they they are related. If you just go with things rather than resist them, that's a more general way to look at it, whether it is other people's ideas on a creative project or whether that is other people's ideas on what pub to go to. Right. I guess it's, it's difficult for me because I don't do that very often. Like most of the time, because I work on my own most of the time, there are rare occasions where I'm collaborating with someone on something. I know that might sound weird because I work in open source, but um, sitting with Martin on Friday, writing a blog post where we had it projected up on the wall and we were trying to, you know, collaboratively write up what had happened that week. That was, that was a nice creative process. And I, I, I don't do enough of that, which is why I want to try and do a bit more blogging this year is because I quite enjoy that. And it's one creative outlet that I have, but that's a very solo thing. It was, it was, it's very different creating on your own. You can't yes and yourself, really, can you? <laughs> well, you can to some extent. I often, when I'm trying to be creative, especially with music, will start writing something and then think, no, that's terrible. That's terrible. I'm going to just start again. Whereas if I just yes ended it and just keep going, keep going. I mean, that is advice that a lot of creative Um, well, successful creative people uh, say, uh, writers, for example, if you want to write for TV or whatever, just write. Even if it's garbage, even if it's just complete nonsense, just write. And to to keep it going, to start the momentum and just keep yes-anding that idea of, yeah, let's just keep this story, even if it's just absolute nonsense. If you write enough, then eventually you'll start to get to a point where you're writing things that you're happy with. Yeah. And I have a colleague who's very much like that. He writes every single day. He'll write a blog post a day and writes books and other articles, but there's never a day goes by. He's got a chunk blocked out in his day for writing and he just is very prolific. And yeah, some of it is hot garbage and some of it's not necessarily the best grammatically or well thought out, but it's, it's all content. And you know, eventually some of it turns into gold. I feel like this goes really well with um, a piece of advice that I heard about um, kind of pursuing a startup, but it's the idea of do things that are unintuitive. And I think that's kind of what yes and can get you is to places where you wouldn't have thought that was a good idea, but you wouldn't really know until you explore it. Yeah, but if you're not careful, you end up uh, looking at yourself in the mirror, telling yourself how great you are. What makes you cringe? I don't know if it's just like a, a pet peeve or or if it's like a real cringe, but I kind of don't like it when people say that they've upgraded something when what they mean is they've completely replaced it with a totally different thing. I just kind of go, Ugh, why? That's not what that word means. I've upgraded my iPhone. No, you haven't. You can't. You can't do that. Do you get equally annoyed when people say, I've downloaded something to the server? Uh, is that is that cringeworthy? Yeah, I don't like it. But what's the difference between something that makes you cringe and a pet peeve, though? I guess, is it the face? Is it the face you make? Or are you like, ah, oh, ah? Oh. I think it's something you want to stop happening immediately. 
if someone just says something wrong, you might correct them and carry on with the conversation. But for me, a cringe is something that I really need this to stop right now because it's making me feel bad. Yeah. What, like uh, the amount of people who uh, say H? I don't mind that. I mean, you're you're both picking on the grammatical ones, and I, you know, I'm I also appreciate a good grammatical failure or a mispronunciation um, as much as the next guy. But those aren't the things that make me cringe. I might get annoyed or amused by those, but the things that make me cringe are actually things that are designed to make you cringe. Like there are certain TV programs where. I think the one that got me that I really realized was when The Office, the UK version of The Office first came out. And I remember sitting watching it and then going, nope, and just <laughs> turning it off halfway through because I really enjoyed it. And I, I felt this, this is new and innovative television entertainment, but it gets me to the point where I have to look away. And I think that is, that's cringe. That's the epitome of cringe is Ricky Gervais's character doing something cringe worthy. And you're just thinking, Oh, Oh dear. Oh no, that, you know, and if you see it in real life, when someone does that and all the people who witness the cringe look at each other and go, Ooh, that, that's a cringe, I think. And if in real life, um, I think multiple people often recognize a cringe um, at the same time, R rather than the grammatical issues where it's only like the uh, anal nerd in the room who's like, well, actually, it's pronounced like this. Actually, it's number of people. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Socks with sandals. I don't like it. That makes you cringe, or does it just make you angry? Yeah, I don't know. I just... <laughs> Think of the things that make me uncomfortable. I think that's just pet hate style. I think cringe is a very specific uh, emotion. Is it emotion or reaction? Whatever. Yeah, it is. I think it is a emotion, an emotional reaction. I think definitely, especially when there's collective cringe, where multiple people recognise the cringe that's happened and can look at each other and think, "Ay, ay, ay, I would not want to be him." I've also had cringe at conferences where people have given spectacularly shit talks. Mm. And that, that is, that is cringe because you've got group cringe where all of you are in the audience and you can kind of look around and you might catch the eye of someone else who's clearly not having a good time, but you can never say anything. I've seen these, you know, top 10 things you should do when you're at an event. And one of them is don't tell the speaker that they did a shit job. Um, you know, or something like that. But sometimes it's not just when their demo fails or it's when they don't know their content and they clearly haven't prepared and all their slides are like PowerPoint hell with loads of bullet points. That's when it invokes. But the, the, the problem with that is with when I'm watching the office on TV and I get a bit of cringe, I can press the button and turn it off when you're in the audience. And especially when you're in a small audience at a small event, and they're scanning the room. You want them to succeed, but when it gets to the point when they're not succeeding, and I've been there, I've I've stood up in front of people and had moments where I'm pretty sure people in the audience were cringing on my behalf. So I know what that feeling is from the other side, and it's awful. But yeah, that happens too much. Like during lightning talks when they've gone over time and they're trying to compile their code and it's not working and the speaker, they're the MC is like, okay, you need to get off the stage now. And they're like still trying to do it. And everybody's just like, okay. Or they say, oh, I've only got 25 more slides. And you've got like, <laughs> you're overrun by two minutes. Yeah, I've just got to buzz through these 25 slides. No, stop. <laughs> like, leave, leave them wanting more. <laughs> I'm suddenly very cognizant of the number of bullet points on my slides for my podcast in basics talk, which you said was good. And I think you lied to me. Do you know what? While I was saying just now about bullet points on slides, I was thinking about anything but your presentation. But the only thing that would come into my mind was your presentation because I'm talking <laughs> to you and I thought, Oh God, he's going to take this personally. So <laughs> I did know, like, as I was saying, so <laughs> pro tip, uh, there's a great developer advocate called Melinda Seckington, and she gave a talk about two years ago at DevRelCon London. I urge anyone who's going to give a presentation anytime soon to watch Melinda Seckington's talk about making good slides. It is amazeballs, and if you follow her advice, you'll make good 
presentations. I strive to make good presentations like hers. Hers are excellent. And I've never been in a bad presentation that she's given. So she's really adept at it. Some people are not. I would say most people just need more practice. So what makes me cringe is the word amazeballs. Amazeballs.